Buenos dias, buenas tardes, good morning, good afternoon, uh, family. Uh, we are here with one of our live webinars here with Abriendo Puertas. My name is Javier Martinez, and I am the Managing Director of National Policy for Abriendo Puertas Opening Doors. Abriendo Puertas is a, a, a national organization uh, based in more than 42 states where we work with families, with young children uh, to unlock their potential as leaders, to reconnect people to their leadership and to advocate for a better future for their children. Uh, today's webinar will be focused on the Whole Learner Act, which is a collaboration uh, between Abriendo Puertas and America Forward, America Forward being the lead organization behind this important piece of federal legislation. Uh, before we begin, I wanna remind you that this webinar is being broadcast also in Espanol, um, and all you've gotta do is hit the globe at the bottom where it says interpretation, uh, select your language, uh, and then you can go back and forth at that point uh, between either language. Uh, also, there's a, a question and answer section um, at the bottom of the screen where you can uh, make comments or, or ask questions that you might have. Um, by way of background, uh, Abriendo Puertas has been engaged, uh, like I said, in more than 40 plus states over the last 20 plus years. Uh, and over the last couple of years, we've really made a focus in, a, in an attempt to work more at the national level. Uh, it is at that space that we meet our good friends at America Forward, a forward thinking organization that's working on a variety of different issues, including economic security, healthcare, and education. Uh, that's how we come here today. Uh, over the last year or so, Abriendo Puertas and America Forward have worked on something called the Whole Earner Act, which uh, really is designed to unlock the full potential of our children and our families when it comes to their learning, when it comes to their development, and when it comes to the things that they need to succeed in school, in their community, and in life. Uh, so today I'm proud to introduce uh, two good friends of mine uh, and two amazing advocates with America Forward, um, Anthony Covell and Dimari Kreck, who will be giving us some insights and, and really digging deeper into what's in the whole Learner Act and how it impacts your family and your community. Uh, so I'll kick it off to you guys. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Javier. Hi, everyone. My name is Anthony Covell. Um, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, I am the Manager of Government Affairs at America Forward. Um, I'm joined today by my colleague, Timari Creaky, who I'll hand it over to in a few moments to introduce himself and the whole Learner Act. Um, that we're presenting you with today. Um, I've been with America Forward for three years, um, and prior to this, I worked for the United States Senate doing COVID funding implementation in Arizona, where I am based today. Uh, America Forward is the nonpartisan policy initiative of New Profit. Um, New Profit is a national venture philanthropy organization committed to investing in nonprofits across the country that work in the education, workforce development, economic mobility, and democracy restoration spaces. Um, at America Forward, we represent a coalition of over 100 nonprofits in all 50 states and Puerto Rico, including Abrandos, Abrandos Puertas. Um, and we work with those organizations to develop um, innovative, evidence-based, solutions-oriented policies um, that we present to lawmakers and policymakers up on the Hill in federal agencies, specifically at the Department of Education, Department of Labor, and the Department of the Treasury. Um, and we advocate with our coalition organizations, um, specifically on, on this bill, the Whole Learner Act. Um, we have a great network of, of advocates um, and Whole Learner-focused organizations that have helped us develop this policy and this bill, um, and has been informed by the work that they do on the ground with students, teachers, parents, um, and administrators. So a little bit of background on our whole learner work. Um, back in 2019 and 2020, America Forward in partnership with the Lego Foundation uh, saw a need for innovative learning concepts that incorporate a holistic need, the holistic needs of students. We know that now more than ever, students need a range of skills to succeed in school and in life, but our current education system is not equipped to deliver these critical tools to every student. Together with our coalition members like Abrandos Puertas, we developed a whole learner policy roadmap to provide policymakers, advocates like you, and schools with resources that they need to socialize, advocate, and enact whole learner concepts in federal legislation, 
programming and funding streams. And Dimari just dropped a link to our whole winner website, which includes our whole winner policy roadmap and some other resources. The science of learning and development tells us that learners of all ages need a variety of healthy, engaging learning experiences. In order to optimize opportunities for success, learners need experiences that are grounded in strong developmental relationships and safe environments and support the development of a broad set of physical, social, cognitive, creative, and emotional skills. Our whole learner policy roadmap lays out how to bring these skills to students while ensuring their full breadth of skills and needs are being addressed. Our concepts in the whole learner policy roadmap include designing connected, engaging learning experiences, taking a holistic approach to achieve key outcomes, breaking down barriers to developing a breadth of skills, advancing equity is always one of our top priorities in all of our policies, and leveraging partnerships and proximate voices to address the relevant needs of students within their respective communities. With all of this in mind, we have written legislation that has been iterated on multiple times since we started this work in 2020. First, to address the immediate and emergent, emergent needs of students during the pandemic and then in the wake of the pandemic. And now with our ever-evolving political landscape and Congress, we've landed on the Whole Learner Act, which I'll pass to Tamari to talk about. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Zimari Kriki. I lead our whole owner work at America Forward. I have been working in education policy for over eight years and I've been with America Forward for one year. Um, I focus mostly on our whole owner work with the Lego Foundation and our other partners that allows us to address the breadth of skills that students need to be successful in careers and in college. And I also work with our advocacy team on any federal education legislation that may be emerging. Um, so I'm excited to present on the Whole Learner Act today. And if we can get those slides back up. Awesome. And slide number three, we'll dive deeper into the Whole Learner Act. So the goal of this legislation is to address student needs through a whole learner approach to education, which Anthony explained earlier. Um, we hope to establish a definition for whole learner approaches at the federal level that is rooted in evidence-based practices, such as the science of learning and development and how youth learn and thrive using creative approaches to education and playful learning. So we're hoping to use this legislation to create a competitive federal grant program to incentivize mental health and trauma-informed supports in schools for both teachers, school support staff, and students. We're hoping to embed learning through play into the classroom for students of all ages, not just in early childhood education, looking to develop whole learner focused professional development and training for teachers so that they're able to embed these approaches to education in their classroom. And then we are also hoping to have active parent and family engagement in these approaches to education, prioritizing low income and high need schools so that the students who need it the most can get the supports that they need. Um, back one. <laughs> um, we're requesting $2 million for FY25 and um, such sums for each of the five succeeding fiscal years after this, it would be a five-year competitive grant program. And what's unique about this legislation that is different from other legislation in the federal government is that the partnership requires a nonprofit organization or a community-based organization with expertise in whole learner approaches and the local education agency. And then they could also partner with other additional entities such as other local education agencies, state educational agencies, institutes of higher education and other nonprofit organizations. This will allow the whole learner approaches to be spread out across the duration of the partnership and also not overburden the teachers and school staff with implementing these whole learner approaches by themselves. Um, next slide. And then we also know that for policymakers, it's important that they're able to see these in action. So we designed a whole learner white paper that will articulate the vision of whole learner education, highlight the federal support for whole learner education and other legislation, such as the ARP ESSER funds and the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. We also have spotlighted different example organizations who embody a whole learner education approach, such as um, the Bar Center, Transcend for Education, Apple Tree Institute, for education and the Center for Whole Child Education. 
And you'll also hear from Abby in the process and how their work aligns with whole education later on. And then we also emphasize the need for a dedicated federal funding stream to support the whole learning education initiatives, which are different from whole child initiatives in that they focus on the breadth of skills and um, the science of learning and development, as opposed to just embedding services into the um, school system. And now I'll pass it back to Anthony to talk about our whole learner Hill engagement. Thanks, Dimari. So back in January, uh, we hosted a two-day Whole Learner Hill Days event that included 12 America Forward Coalition members, including Abrandos Partas. We were able to meet with over 30 congressional offices within our two days uh, during our advocacy push and made tremendous progress in socializing Whole Learner concepts with offices on the House Education and Workforce Committee and the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, otherwise known as the HELP Committee. Um, I'd like to pass it to Christina or Javier if they would like to talk about their experience um, at our Whole Learner Hill Days back in January, um, just so y'all can get a little bit more context as to what went down there. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Um, so for the for the Hill Days, um, we were really grateful that we were invited and hosted by America Forward. And we actually had like a range of different activities, starting with like a training uh, for advocates. Um, and it was a brief training. Um, we, we really focused on our alignment as uh, organizations and part of like the coalition. Even though we came from diverse communities, we really brought forward the experiences and stories of the community that we work with. And I think that was really powerful when we were meeting with um, legislative uh, staff from different senators office. Um, and as we made our way to really get bipartisan support for the Whole Learner Act. So um, I think one of the most important things that I took away from that is um, just like the importance of sharing the stories and really sharing what's happening on the ground and looking that looking at the alignment between organizations. And it didn't really matter like where we were coming from, we had a goal, we had an alignment, we want things that are great for learners, and we want to support that work. Um, and it really empowered the way that we moved forward. Um, and, you know, like, de depending on which um, states you were coming from, and sometimes you think that your stories are entirely different, but really there is alignment in the needs that we have for our learners um, in the nation. So it's really powerful to come together with a group of such uh, powerful advocates and really have the support and guidance from America Forward. Thanks, Christina. Yeah, uh, and if I may add, um, yeah, Anthony, I, I was not involved in the whole Learner Hill Day, but I was involved uh, in one of your prior Hill Days. Uh, I believe it was last summer. Um, and as, a, as an organization that is uh, attempting to break into federal advocacy work, uh, I've got to tell you, you all really do have it down. You know what you're doing. You know how to engage in meaningful and insightful ways in a place as sometimes uh, intimidating as Congress can be. Uh, so kudos to you all for uh, the good work that you do with your Hill Days, uh, whether it's Whole Learner Act or, or any of the other great initiatives that you work on. Thanks, Javier. And it's all because of the advocates and supporters like you. So thank you very much. Um, so from our Whole Learner Hill days, um, we uh, continued on with our advocacy um, and pressing forward on trying to find a sponsor for the bill in both the House and the Senate. Um, we conducted several follow-up meetings with um, offices that we found um, expressed enthusiasm about the, about the bill or about the concepts during our Whole Learner Hill days. Um, and I'm excited to share that we are very, very close to um, securing a House sponsor for the bill. Um, and we'll be ecstatic to share more once we are able. Um, we've also adapted our strategy um, to include an appropriations push um, for the whole learner, uh, for our whole learner concepts as well. Um, and our, our appropriations push right now, which is completely tied to the whole learner act, is um, an authorization of 50 to $100 million um, for a pilot program at the Department of Education to authorize um, a program like the one that we're advocating for in the Whole Learner Act. Um, and while the fiscal year 2025 appropriation cycle 
is sort of underway, um, we will um, continue to advocate for funding for whole winter concepts and the authorization of this pilot program and keep you all updated on how that goes as well. Um, and I think with that, I am passing it on. Thank you, Anthony and, and Dimari for that uh, breakdown of the Whole Learner Act and what's included in the, in the concept, um, as well as the next steps. I think one of the things that is important to recognize, and this is especially uh, for our audience members, is how important it is to, uh, to have patience. Uh, something of this scope can take a long time, especially in Congress, especially as broken as Congress can, can feel sometimes. Uh, but I, I really appreciate that that nugget you left with uh, us with at the end, right? That we may not have to pass the entire act right away to start having an impact. We might be able to get a budget authorization for a piece of the funding to start piloting in a way some of these great concepts in some of our communities. So again, kudos to you all for your forward thinking, uh, no pun intended, I guess. That's why your name is America Forward uh, Strategies when it comes to this work. Uh, let's move on before we get to questions. Let's move on to one of our other panelists and other guests here on this on this webinar, and that is Dr. Brenda Garcia, who is the assistant principal at Century Community Charter School. Uh, Dr. Garcia, um, in, in in my conversations with our team, uh, it seems like you are in a way helping implement some of these things already in your own community, in your own school. Um, and I'm curious to hear from you. First of all, give us a, a good intro of who you are, what you do, what your school does, how it's implementing these strategies. Uh, and then furthermore, tell us a little bit about how those strategies can help our families and their children thrive. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Uh, buenos dias también. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor just to share our story. Um, we are a small school, and I think that that is uh, a blessing in that sense that we know everyone. We are we are a family, and we've been here for now 20 years. So a lot of our parents and even siblings, we have seen grow throughout the years and have assisted in just the different needs that they've had. Um, our school is really focused on the, the culture that we promote and that we foster, not only with our staff and our community and our families, but just within each other. So one of the things that, you know, I love uh, of everything that I'm hearing is, is the importance of the whole child, you know, and that is not any party in particular. Like we, if we, when we work together, we see the difference that we can make in, in the lives of our children and their families. Um, things that we do, you know, we, we have teams. We have a lot of teams. Nobody does anything by themselves. We collaborate a lot. Uh, we foster that leadership and that enthusiasm to continue to, um, you know, support our families. And we're constantly reminded of our why. Why are we here? You know, it's like these these children need us. And, and we know that through COVID, after COVID, uh, pre-COVID, you know, none of these needs were new. They just were exacerbated. And we had, how did, how did we have to shift? You know, how did we do that? And it really was because of the trust that we had and, and the, um, collaboration that we've had with our families throughout the years. And now, um, you know, our, our mental health framework is it's very robust and that includes everyone. So one of the things that, you know, we were really constantly looking is for community partnerships, but then our multi-tier system of support, it really isn't just about the student. It's about, you know, the parents, how do, how our parents' needs you know, seen in that same sense, our staff needs. Because we need to understand that every one of us, you know, has an impact on our students. So when we look at um, our community partnerships, we also look at assessing the needs. What are the needs of our students? What are, are the needs of our parents? Um, and within that, that's where we bring in programs such as Abriendo Puertas um, and other organizations that we partnered with that we are, you know, able and fortunate enough to be able to reach out and say, this is what's happening. How do we address this? We don't know it all. Um, and, and having the, the different leaders and teams and then that leadership being uh, fostered among everyone, it, we also have that responsibility to make sure that everybody's taken care of. 
So one of the things that we do is, you, you know, we do universal screening, uh, we do um, just discussions, we look at all the different things from a child that is just goes beyond the grades and the absences, um, you know, referrals. Yeah, that's a, a, an important part of it, but that's not the whole child. You know, we, we talk to parents, we bring parents in, we offer workshops, we um, do everything that we can to support them because um, as part of one of the things that I found out in my dissertation was that parents want to be, um, you know, better for their children. They want to be able to support them. And a lot of times they just don't know how. They're scared. They're um, almost stuck sometimes because they, they feel like they're doing everything. But it is through these programs that we're able to really um, find out what they need and how is it that we can support their efforts in supporting their children academically and outside of the academics as well with their social emotional learning um, and then everything else that we can do to support them beyond that uh, with parents are struggling to pay rent parents are struggling to put food on the table so all of those things small components become like the bigger picture of how we support the whole child. Thank you for that, and thank you for the work that you're doing. I think it is it is critical, um, especially uh, this day and age. Um, it seems like every election cycle, a lot of our families become, uh, uh, whether we like it or not, unfortunately, sometimes uh, part of that political debate and, and having those support systems embedded in our communities for the child and for their families is critical for their development. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring back. Uh, Dimari and, and Anthony, um, we, we've got a, we've got a few questions here that we wanna we wanna get out there. Um, and just as a reminder to our audience, uh, feel free to uh, send your comments through the chat. Uh, send any questions you might have through the chat function. We'll we'll try to get as many of those uh, out as possible to you uh, to, to our panelists here today. Uh, but I want to start with our friends at America Forward, um, and I want to ask about how this proposed funding for the whole learner act how it's different from funds that are already uh, in federal education legislation yeah thanks javier um this is a great question and one that we received a lot while we were up on the hill um especially um the comparison that a, a lot of folks were making to full service community schools which is a program that America Forward is fully supportive of and advocates um, for in our appropriations, our full appropriations push every year. Um, and while we see full service community schools as complementary to our whole Learner Act um, proposal with supporting students and promoting family engagement at their core, we see some key differences as well. Um, while full service community schools focuses on providing external support like food assistance, health services, counseling, and other wraparound services to help improve student outcomes, that is by bringing these services into the school community to ensure students and families can get easier access to them and ensure their needs are fully served. The Whole Learner Act, on the other hand, seeks an internal transformation within schools and is focused on the pedagogy and the way that, that students are learning. This transformation involves redefining the way teachers approach student learning and family engagement and institutionalizing whole learner approaches in classrooms to better cater to students' holistic needs and the breadth of skills needed for youth to thrive. Hope that answers your question, Javier. Great, yeah, it does, thank you. Uh, we've got a question here from the audience. Um, and I'm going to throw this out um, to whoever would like to answer it. The question is, if this legislation would allow for K-12 partners to use the funding with pre-K and transitional type of kindergarten, as well as early education whole learner approach or approaches and programs. So can this funding be extended to be used with some of those early learning uh, systems that are embedded in our community and that help support the K-12 system. Sure, I can take this question. Um, currently, the Whole Learner Act is mainly focused on K-12 education. So um, any standalone programs that do pre-K, transitional kindergarten and early education without incorporating that K-12 aspect would not, would not be eligible for this funding, unfortunately. However, 
if they are connected to a school or a school system that has those um, programs th that has K through 12, in addition to these programs, they could be used to support those programs as well as those would be an um, intervention into getting students into K through 12 education schools directly. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Jumari. Um, anything else from anyone else, that, uh, Anthony, or, or uh, anything that you want to add, or are we good there? Uh, no, I think Jumari um, sort of summed it up um, pretty, Perfect. pretty comprehensively. Perfect. Um, let me move on. I'm trying to navigate here my screen with the Q&A. Uh, okay, this one is in Espanol. Uh, let, give me a sec to read it first and translate it in my brain. Okay, this is actually a question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think I'm, I, um, I'm gonna take a stab at it, and then I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna pitch it over to Dr. Garcia because I think it, it really, it relates more to how to get parent leaders involved. So, uh, Dr. Garcia, the question is, um, as, as a, as a, as a parent, how are we gonna identify parent leaders who can connect to the most vulnerable families? who because of work issues, right? People are working two, three jobs sometimes just to make ends meet, cannot be a part of an advocacy framework or an advocacy effort. So how do we, how do we identify parent leaders who can reach the most vulnerable families and pull them into the advocacy space? Um, can you give us an example of how you all do that at your charter school? Yes, for sure. Thank you so much. That's a great question. And that's something that um, I don't think there is like this one solution because every community is very different and you talk about you know parents having different jobs and the, the circumstances for every family are very different um, but one of the things and I, I think I mentioned this earlier was relationships like just taking the time to be outside and greet the parents greet the the children um, and when they come in um, even if they come in for something else just learn about them you know what how are they doing what do they need? Uh, follow up on your surveys. To me, it's like make a promise, keep a promise. You know, it's like if you're asking for their feedback, um, then re reply with like, okay, in this survey, we had this. And then from there, you you say, please talk to me, call me. My I have an open door policy. Parents, um, and sometimes, and I do get parents where it's like, Miss Garcia, I can call. I am on my way to do this. It's like, okay, five minutes. I, you know, they have my cell phone. Uh, ¿Cómo le puedo ayudar? ¿Qué necesita? Um, and it is finding their way, you know, it, a lot of the times it's like, oh, you know, if you don't come to my office, I can't know, like, you know, I, I've gone to homes, um, I've stepped outside and it's like, I can't leave the car because I have my little one here and I don't want to wake them up. So I think going out of your way to, to make, create those relationships when parents know that you are in, you know, on their team, they it's almost like a word of mouth, right? Like I've had people come and it's like, where's Ms. Garcia? And I'm like, me, and I've never seen this person. And it's like, but so-and-so told me that you could help me. And I was like, got it. You know, it's like, okay. And, and, and I feel wonderful just because it, um, I feel that I've done my job. That's why I'm here. So I think that when we truly believe and know why we're here and what we're doing, parents will come and then they will talk to other parents because I, it's happened to me. It's like, you know, or um, no, no pueden venir ahora and, and they're communicating and then they'll come and Ms. Garcia, did you know that so-and-so's, you know, they're, they're having this issue and they might not, but they want to advocate for their friends, for their families, for, you know, their community. So they'll come and then we reach out. Um, and it's never done in a, in, in a sense or in a place of, of harm, but it's more like man, we care and, and you know, and we know that you care too, this community cares, and that's why we're saying that. So I think the relationship that you build with the community and the individual parents is very, very important to get those leaders. And I, I we have sessions, and even one of our Abriendo Puerta session, like you are leaders, you're advocates. Have you done this before? Yes, it's like, well, that's what that is, you know, for them to acknowledge that they are doing a lot already and how is it that they can help other parents do the same. Yeah, that, that's a great that's a great uh, answer and something that I I, I certainly and our organization can certainly identify with. Right, um, it is the relationships, it is the word of mouth. Uh, I love the example you gave, right? That sometimes mm -hmm. people can't come to the meeting, but 
uh, you know, two weeks later, you'll see them and they'll tell you exactly what happened at the meeting because mm -hmm. somebody told them, somebody called them, somebody texted them, you know, somebody reported it live on Facebook or whatever the case <laughs> might be, uh, which is, which is great. Um, let, let me, let me, uh, let me move on to a, another question. Um, and I'm going to go back to Demari because this is actually a question that, um, I think really impacts a, a large segment of our, of, of Abriendo Puertas's uh, community network. And, uh, and these are folks who are English language learner, uh, uh, learners, as well as uh, immigrant families in our schools. So, um, Damari, can you tell us how the whole Learner Act can be useful for the benefit of English language learners, as well as immigrant families in our schools? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, one of the things that um, is really important to this legislation is creating transformative school systems. And I think that definitely starts with the migrant communities and the English language learners. In a lot of cases, English language learner instruction has been targeted at um, getting the students to learn English. It's been targeted at getting them assimilated into American culture. And um, the whole act can be used to kind of transform that and rethink the way that we approach English language instruction, maybe doing something closer to bilingual instruction or things like that. But it's really focused on engaging with the community as well, which is why I think it'll also help with migrant populations, because it encourages the parents to be involved in the design and the execution of these systems so that they'll be able to understand what exactly is my child learning? How can I show up as a parent to these different events and things like that to support their learning and development? How can I bring things home to support the engagement of learning and development at home as well? So in those ways, this legislation will be able to support ELL and migrant communities. And um, I encourage anyone that wants this legislation um, go through the process and should it be passed to continue to engage with your school systems, engage with your local policymakers to make sure that um, this funding does exactly what it is intended to do. Um, because we really need the support of the parents and the support of the school leaders, the support of the community based organizations, the support of everyone involved in the learning and development of a child to ensure that these funds go to the communities that really need it the most and that they're able to do the most good. Yeah, and Javier, I'll add to that. And I just want to yeah. really emphasize that um, a major portion, a major part of this legislation is the partnerships, the local community based partnerships. And so we see this as, as a, a proposal that can be applied in a multitude of contexts. So whether it's, you know, students that are in ELL programs in Phoenix, Arizona, or, you know, uh, students that are living in rural Kentucky, we want this to be able to be applied to a multitude of, of contexts. And that is all based in the community partnerships, partnerships with nonprofits, the local education agencies, and the federal government. And we see that as one of the tools that will sort of help with um, what you're asking about. So good deal. And, and let me let me follow up on that because I just I just got a text from somebody who's watching and, and um, they're wondering if we can uh, expand a little bit on, on, on what a local educational agency is. Um, and uh, I, I've got, I think I have uh, I think I have my own idea of what those are in my home state of New Mexico. Uh, but generally speaking, what is a, 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 an educational agency? I'll pass that to Dumari, our, our education policy expert. <laughs> sure. So when we say local education agency, we're talking about your school districts, um, your school boards, your um, like anyone who is responsible in the local context. So not take your state. Um, you have like, so in education policy, there are different entities that are responsible for the education of students. You have the federal government that operates the U.S. Department of Education, um, who takes the um, federal appropriations funds and helps to make sure that schools are able to get them and also establishes guidelines for the use of those funds. You have your state education agencies, so the people at the um, state level, your um, state education agency um, superintendent, or your commissioner who may be elected, who might be appointed. It really depends on the local context of your state. And then you also have your school boards and your school districts um, who will make curriculum decisions, who are able to um, hire teachers and um, kind of staff the, the schools and things of that nature. So when we say local education agencies, we're really focusing on as granular level as possible under the um, education department. So those organizations that are like your school districts where you're like, property tax money would go to 
um, your school boards who um, may also be elected or appointed and um, make the decisions. Um, those would have to work in tandem with the nonprofit organization or the community-based organization to make sure that these funds are used appropriately and that they actually are used to meet the needs of what the community is seeing as a real-time need. And 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 just uh, out of curiosity, so so uh, theoretically, uh, would the state education, the, the state Department of Education, you know, fill in the state, New Mexico, California, Texas, Maryland, would apply for funding from the Whole Learner Act, the two hundred million dollar pot. Say they would apply for twenty million dollars, and that particular education agency would then subgrant to local school districts, assuming, of course, that those local school districts have creative partnerships with nonprofits, community groups, and other service providers. Is that is that the 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 clearest path for the funding to flow down to the families? So the way that it's set up now is actually set up for the. Um nonprofit organization to kind of be that fiscal agent, ideally. Because ah, um, okay. again, we don't want to overburden the um, school systems that are already dealing with a lot. Um, we realize that school resources can be stretched pretty thin and um, and often like teachers, school administrators, school staff are dealing with a lot on top of like then being asked to implement this new approach to education. So ideally we would have the um, nonprofit organization apply for the funds on behalf of the local education agency which would then um, be able to utilize those funds through that um, fiscal partnership that they have with the nonprofit. And then they'd be able to um, ensure that those um, funds are being used in the correct manner. Um, so the state, can, gotcha. and the state can still be a partner in this work. Um, I've worked in a couple of different districts before and um, what will usually happen is that the um, local education agency will decide what they need the money to be used for. And then they'll say, hey, is there somebody at the state that focuses on this particular topic? So for example, if their whole owner approach is focused on um, revamping their ELL curriculum, for example, they would reach out to the State Department of Education and say, hey, do you have an ELL specialist who might have some additional time to be able to, to, to dedicate to this work and help us with, re with revamping this? And then they would be looped in as a partner in the work. But the um, Onus would mainly be on the community-based organization and the LEA to kind of steward that relationship together and to foster the implementation of this partnership. Got it, got it. So, so this is an opportunity for, for our nonprofit implementation partners across the country to, to work with their local school district. Uh, in some cases, uh, charter schools, uh, at least in my home state of New Mexico, charter schools are considered almost their own school district. So it's a great opportunity for nonprofits, school districts to get together, uh, pull together a really strong application, and then bid for, uh, uh, propose uh, a, a program that can be funded through the Whole Learner Act, uh, which I think is a tremendous opportunity, both in terms of what it means for the children and their families, as well as what it does to grow the power and the reach of our community-based organizations. Uh, that's, that's a, I think that's one of the, hidden uh, uh, gems of, of this whole thing is, is how this can help support that process. Uh, we've got time for a few more questions and, and I don't want uh, I don't want to keep us too too much over time but uh, uh, this is probably also for uh, uh, for you Demari sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, when it comes to to family engagement, which is the bread and butter of the end of podcast is, is building that like as I said earlier that family, leadership so that they can become their child's best advocate. Uh, when it comes to family engagement, are there opportunities within the Whole Learner Act to help support the engagement in the educational process of those families uh, 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 and, and, and even, even beyond the families, but the community as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially because we have the partnership with the um nonprofit organization and the local education agency, there's definitely some opportunity there for them to really think about how they want to engage with parents and with other um, family members, because we know that in many communities, um, parents, like birth parents, are not always the um, legal guardians of children, and they may have um, other proxy parents and other um, individuals in their families that um, take a bit of a lead in the educational development of students. So we want to make sure that um, the communities are authentically engaging with the communities as 
much as possible. Um, so that may look at, at like um, diversifying your outreach approach. Like if you're doing most, mostly um, outreach via email or um, digital methods, like um, using some of that money to invest in um, some different approaches to outreach, like um, a fundraiser or something that would like encourage parents to come um, doing different things such as um, looking at what the community needs and um, getting the parents involved in the like design and implementation of those um, transformative school systems. So we really want parents to be engaged as much as possible in the um, development of their students because we know that once families are involved, students tend to do a lot better, even with micro interventions and other smaller things that are able to like have a transformative um, impact on the development of students. So we're really hoping that this act will be used to foster those authentic partnerships and um, really be used to transform not only the way that the school educates the students, but the way that they authentically engage with their community-based partners, families, and other stakeholders in the education landscape. Got it, thank you. Um, okay, we've got time for like one more question, but I, uh, I did just get uh, another text. Uh, so earlier, uh, one of the questions asked from the audience was, if the whole learner act had an application to those support systems for k-12 specifically early learning early childhood education um, this question is uh, with regard to adult basic education um, and my understanding is that the whole learner act does not uh, provide for that yet uh, but it seems to me and, and correct me if i'm wrong it seems to me that this is the first step so once we get this passed and on the books it seems to me that this can be expanded to include both early learning as well as uh, adult basic education. And the reason I bring it up is uh, in many of our communities, um, and, and ben, uh, Dr. Garcia, you, you could probably attest to this. One of the hooks, if you will, that sometimes brings parents into the, into the school to be engaged is there's an offering of an ESL class for them, uh, or maybe there's a citizenship, citizenship class or maybe there's some sort of abriendo puertas type of uh, educational opportunity that gets that mom, that dad connected in a very personal way, as well as uh, uh, through their child's education. Uh, is, that a, is that a fair uh, uh, aspiration, uh, Dimari and Anthony? I would say definitely it's a fair aspiration and one that we've already started to consider. Um, so like I said in the beginning of the call, in addition to education, our organization focuses on workforce development and economic mobility. And that includes a lot of adult learning programs. Um, and one of the major pieces of legislation that's moving through Congress, Congress right now is the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Um, and so we have sort of incorporated whole learner concepts into our WIOA proposals and WIOA recommendations and priorities. Um, because we know that, you know, learning doesn't stop in, in the K through 12 classroom or even in post-secondary classrooms. Um, it happens in workforce development programming and apprenticeships and training programs like that. So we have tried to um, sort of in our initial phases of, of WIOA outreach and um, uh, advocacy, try to incorporate um, whole learner approaches into um our, our pushes there as well. And it's something that we'll continue to push for um, and incorporate throughout all of our, all of, because we work from early learning all the way through workforce development. So we're really thinking of this as a concept that can bleed into all of those stages of life, whether it's, you know, pre-K or a workforce development training program. I hope that addresses your question. Yes, no, it does. It does. Thank you so much. Um, and before we wrap up, I, I do want to uh, uh, direct the attention of the audience to the chat. Uh, Dimari posted both a, a one pager to the whole learner act that can give you a full briefing of what's included, um, as well as their white paper, uh, which is a more uh, uh, detailed uh, version of what's in the whole learner act. Uh, I'm also going to invite you to uh, click on uh, a form that we're going to throw on the chat here shortly. Uh, that is an interest form in the whole learner act. If you're interested in the whole learner act, click on the link, sign up, uh, uh, show your support for this. As we move forward over the next few months, uh, as Demaria and Anthony stated earlier, we uh, they are very close to securing a house sponsor 
uh, and, and I know you guys have been working really hard uh, over the last few months to get this done. So I'm very excited to 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 hear about who it is and, and get that process going. But uh, that will be an opportunity for all of you, all of you audience members, all of your community groups, all of the schools out there, out of the a lot of the families out there, to become engaged firsthand in this very critical uh, piece of legislation. Um, and you and you can do so through Abriendo Puertas, you can do so through America Forward, uh, you can do so through uh, several of the other partner and implementation partner organizations that we work with. Um, uh, and if you click on that every action form, it'll, it'll populate information for us so that we can reach you and let you know and keep you posted as to how the whole Learner Act is moving. Uh, lastly, there was a question that we didn't get to, but really relates to what I just said. And the question was, how can Abriendo Puertas implementation partners get involved in Hill Days? Um, and so, uh, 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 Anthony and, and Dimari, when is your next Hill Day? If you have the date, maybe you can drop it now and, and we can start making plans to have some of those implementation partners join us as well at the next one. Yeah, absolutely. So I will say that, um, you know, usually, and Javier, you alluded to um, the Hill Days that we did last summer and that we usually do. Every June is typically our appropriations hill days that we um, do, but with the ever-changing appropriation cycle and how that has gone the past two years in Congress, um, which spoiler alert has gone very poorly, we have adjusted our um, sort of our strategy on on how we are leveraging our summer months to advocate. So we will be doing a sort of America Forward Summer Advocacy Initiative, which is more so comprehensive of our appropriations language, our Whole Learner Act, and our WIOA um, uh, advocacy. So we will be reaching out to Abriendo Puertas and um, their partners very soon with ways to engage in our Summer Advocacy Initiative. Um, and there's a lot more information coming down the pipe in the next two weeks. So we will definitely keep you all updated on that. But we will, we know that having folks on the ground, teachers, parents, students, having those voices in meetings with us or by themselves when we're up on the hill creates so much more ethos in what we're trying to advocate for. And it just, it, it is so much more powerful. So we invite you, we welcome you to get involved in this advocacy. Um, and we think it would be tremendously helpful in moving this concept forward on the hill. Fantastic. Well, with that, uh, we will uh, we will leave it. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dimari Krecki with America Forward, Anthony Covell with America Forward for your partnership and your willingness to participate today. Dr. Brenda Garcia, thank you for joining us today, sharing your expertise and, and, and really, I think, helping us understand and contextualize what this could mean in every community if we can get this thing passed uh, in Congress. Uh, I want to also thank our, our amazing team at Abriendo Puertas, Josefina Bojorquez, uh, Cristina Gonzalez, Liline Carrillo for all of your work behind the scenes, and our wonderful interpreter, uh, Denise. I'm sorry, we were going quick. Some, we were going fast. I, I saw your, I, I saw the chats after the fact and I said, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully you survived. It looks like you did. Wonderful. <laughs> Uh, folks, uh, uh, shameless plug-in. We have another webinar coming up May 21st, 11 a.m. Mountain Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Time, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And it is around the concept of building wealth in our community, specifically the idea of baby bonds. Should every baby born in the United States of a certain income level be vested in a savings account that can then be cashed in when that baby turns 18 to pay for their first home, to start a business, to pay for college. Uh, we will send out those invitations here shortly. I hope you can join us for that webinar as well. Uh, again, thank you all for being a part of this webinar. It's been very insightful. We are very excited to be a partner with you all on this and let's move forward. Let's get this done. Thank you, everybody.